there is a fundamental difference between the Indic worldview and the Western worldview. All the Abrahamic religions believe that we are human beings with a spiritual life. And depending on how we behave on this planet, someone sitting up there will either send us to heaven or hell. So Jahannu or Jannat. Indic religions, on the other hand, believe that we are spiritual beings with a temporary human life. And we keep coming back on this planet as long as we don't realize the divinity inside us and connect with it. This fundamental principle that we are spiritual beings with a human life is the bedrock of our entire civilization. And nowhere is this principle more clearly illustrated than our civilizational epic Mahabharat. I was first exposed to the Mahabharat when, like most, most of the people in my generation, I watched it as a child on Durdashan when B.R. Chopra's Mahabharat was a big hit. And uh, I've read it several times later in school, at law school, and even today, I regularly lecture about the Mahabharata at several institutions. But every time I read the Mahabharata, there are three big questions that I struggle with. And in course of this talk, I'd like to share these three big questions with you and explain this enduring fascination for Mahabharata that I have. The first question that bothers me when I read the Mahabharata is that, is it possible to clearly define moral ideas? good and bad, right. right and wrong, boons and curses, good and evil. Can we clearly delineate them? In Mahabharata, there are no heroes or villains. Everyone is equally justified in their actions if you look at the story from their perspective. For example, the most hated character in the Mahabharata, even more than Duryodhan, is his maternal uncle, Shakuni. Shakuni is the person who cheats at the game of dice, due to which the Pandavas lose their kingdom. They are sent on a vanvas. Draupadi is molested in the open court. And essentially, the entire war of Mahabharata of Kurukshetra happens. He's the, he's the reason. But do you know his backstory? Shakuni is Gandhari's brother. Gandhari is Duryodhan's, Duryodhan's uh, mother. And he's also the son of Subal, the king of modern day Afghanistan. His primary purpose in life is to take vengeance against Bhishpitama. He does not love Duryodhan or hate the Pandas. His primary rivalry is with Bhishpitama. You see, when they were younger, uh, Bhishpitama invaded uh, modern day Afghanistan. He defeated Subal. And he forcibly took away his beautiful and virtuous sister Gandhari and forced her to marry with a blind man called Dhritarashtra, who was Bhishpitama's nephew. And if this was not enough, Dhritarashtra was a very cruel man. After marriage, he found out that Gandhari was technically a widow. See, when she was born, her stars were aligned in a way that her husband would die the moment she would marry him. So her family got her married to a goat, and they killed the goat. So although it was just a goat, Dhritarashtra could not tolerate the fact that this, this was hidden from him. And so he conquered Subal again, and he put his entire family behind prison. And said that, I will slowly starve you to death. He, he said that everyone will get one mouthful of rice, and I will take the pleasure of watching all of you starve to death slowly for having hidden this one little fact from me. So inside the prison, Subal said that this is unacceptable. If each of us eats our mouthful of rice, our entire family will finish, and there will be no one left to take vengeance. So he decides that I will create a test. Whoever can solve this test will get the entire food allocated to us and will then go on to take vengeance on behalf of our family. And the test was that anyone who could make thread pass through a grain of rice is the wisest and the most intelligent person in the family. And that person will go on to, uh, will deserves to live and will go on to Avengers. And so everyone tries and fails. Incidentally, Shakuni, who's the youngest in the family, the youngest son, he has the idea of tying the thread to an ant, and then the ant finds its way through a grain of rice. And that, so it's decided that all the food that they get will be given to Shakuni. 
Now, can you imagine the trauma of a young boy eating his meals daily while his entire family starves to death in front of him? At the end, when everyone else has died and there is a Subal and Shakuni, Subal uh, calls his son and says, you know, I understand the power of time. As time goes by, you'll forget all of this tragedy and trauma and you will go on to live with your life. So I will do something to you which will always remind you of your life's mission. And so then he breaks his son's leg. You remember, in every depiction of Mahabharata, Shakuni has an evil son and he walks with a limp. And the limp is because his father broke his leg before dying. So that with every step, Shakuni was reminded of the fact that he has to take vengeance. Is he, is he still the epitome of evil? Is he not more of an anti-hero than, than a complete villain? Similarly, in Mahabharata, there are no boons and curses. There are no good or bad decisions. They are interchangeable. When the Pandavas go on one vas, Arjun decides to take a detour and visit his father Indra, who is the king of Devas, uh, in his court. And because Indra is meeting Arjun for the first time, they have a grand celebration where uh, his favorite Apsara, Urvashi, who is also said to be the most beautiful being in the universe, is performing a dance. In course of that performance, she looks at Arjun and she falls in love with him. She lusts after him and so she decides that she, she has to have him. That night, you know, she goes to Arjun's chamber and openly propositions to him. says that, I saw the way you were looking at me in the court. I also have the same feelings about you and I'd like to sleep with you. Arjun is shocked. He says that, I was looking at you because I was reminded of how one of my ancestors, Pururuvas, had a great romance with you. And we are all his, you know, his succeeding generation. So I was looking at you like a mother I had never seen before. To which Urvashi says that, what, what is this uh, argument you're making? You know, we, are, we are dancers. You know, we are dancers in an open court and we don't belong to anyone. You will not break any moral code or commit a transgression if you sleep with me because you know, the rules that apply to human beings don't apply to divine beings like us. We are apsaras. But Arjun says, no, you know, I, uh, it is not dharmic that we indulge in this, in this act because you are also my father's favorite apsara. And so for me, you are like Kunti, Madri, and Sachi, who is Indra's wife. So that is how I look at you. So, Apsara, so Urvashi tells him that you are talking about dharma. Don't you know that it is a man's dharma to oblige a woman when she openly propositions to him, despite societal pressures. It's a man's dharma to oblige her. To which Arjun again refuses. So then she gets angry and she curses him. She says that this manhood of which you are so proud, you will lose that manhood for the rest of your life. So Arjun is shocked and he goes back to his father and says that, what did I do? I was, I was cursed for showing restraint. So then Indra consoles him and tells him that what you've been able to do is something that even the greatest rishis have not been able to manage. You've, you've been able to say no to Urvashi. I will talk to her and I will reduce this curse to a period of one year. And use it in the 13th year of your vanvas. You know, when they lost the game of dice, the terms were that you will go for one vas for 12 years and then go in agyat vas for one year, which means that you have to remain in hiding. And if any of the Kauravs find the Pandavas in that one last year, then they have to repeat the 12 year one vas again. So Indri tells his son that you use this boon, you use this curse as a boon in the final year of your one vas and become a eunuch so that no, will be, no one will be able to find you. A great example of how Boons become curses and curses become boons. The second important question that I've always struggled with when I read the Mahabharata is how much control do we really have over our lives? How much of what, it, what we do is free will and how much of it is destiny? For example, all of us know that Krishna gave the, uh, the Gyan of Gita to Arjun on the first day of the war. But do you know that Arjun was not the first person to whom Krishna made this offer. Before the war started, both sides were trying negotiations and diplomacy to avert this, this great carnage at Kurukshetra. 
And as a last resort, Krishna went to Duryodhan's court to have a word with him and tried to convince him. Duryodhan refused, refused to oblige Krishna in open court. So Krishna tells him, let's, let's talk in private. Let's go for a walk. And when they're alone, Krishna tells Duryodhan that all of this that you see around yourself, all of this, this is me. Like, I am the God of the universe. Right. Let me teach you the wisdom of the Gita. And once you understand its wisdom, you will do what is right and avert this war in Kurukshetra. Do you know what Duryodhan says? Duryodhan looks at Krishna and smiles and says, Krishna, you think I don't know what is right and wrong? You think I don't understand that? Something inside me makes me do the wrong thing. My pravritti is such that I am not sure to do the wrong My nature makes me do the wrong thing. The, the story of the Mahabharata actually starts when Bhish Pitama takes the oath of celibacy. And that's given in a, as an example of, of free will exercised by a character in Mahabharata. Because there was no external motivation, no pressure. He says, decides to remain a celibate so that his father Shantanu can marry this fisher woman Satyavati. But if you lo go back and read the original epic, you again see the role of destiny there. Bhish Pitama was one of the eight Vasus elemental gods who were cursed to be born on earth by sage Vasisht. And so then when they went to Ganga asking to be born as a children, they told Ganga that since we will be born as cursed beings, we will ensure that we don't continue our lineage on earth. So even this great act of free will by Bhish Pitama is actually destined. But if that is the case, then why is the entire Gita about the philosophy of action? About doing the right thing, about karma. And so that is the second question that has always bothered me. How much control do we really have over our lives? The third question that bothers me, that I struggle with when I read the Mahabharat is, What is dharma? What is the right thing to do when faced with complicated choices? And no story illustrates that better than the birth of Dhritarashtra and Pandu. Dhritarashtra is the father of Kauravs. Pandu is the father of Pandus. And the story of Mahabharata is essentially a war between the Kauravs and the Pandus. So, so knowing their birth is critical to understanding the Mahabharata. Dhritarashtra and Pandu are sons of Ambika and Ambalika, who were the wives of Vichitravirya. Vichitravirya was a foster brother of Bhishpitama. He was born out of the union of Satyavati and Shantanu. And when Vichitravirya needed to be married, Satyavati asked Bhishpitama to go and win wives for him. So he went to Kashi, modern day Banaras, and he kidnapped the princesses of Kashi for his brother. Like he had to do again for his nephew with Gandhari. So he kidnapped the princesses of Kashi and got them married to Vichitravirya. But before Vichitravirya could consummate his marriage, he died. And so Satyavati asked Bhishpitama to sleep with uh, Ambika and Ambalika and uh, produce royal heirs. But Bhishpitama told his, his mother that, no, I can't do that because I've taken a vow of celibacy. And that's my dharma, a promise I've made to myself. To which Satyavati says, no, the greater dharma is to listen to your elders, especially your parents, even if it goes against your personal, personal vows. But Bhishpitama is adamant, he refuses. So then Satyavati tells him that, I'll tell you a secret. Before I was married to Shantanu, your father, I had an illegitimate child with Sage Parashar. His name is Ved Vyas. Before he went for his penance, he promised that he would help me whenever I needed his help. So go and call Ved Vyas. So then Ved Vyas comes and then she makes, makes the same offer to him. Again, Ved Vyas is shocked. He said that this is incest. I, I can't do this. To which Satyavati again makes the same argument that 
you should listen to your elders because that is your dharma irrespective of how pleasant or unpleasant it is for you but vedyas agrees with the argument made by satyavati and he then sires uh, dhritarashtra and pandu on ambika and ambalika so the same situation the same choices to be made one great man bhishma pitama chooses one 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 route and vedvyas chooses a completely different route to solve the problem so what is dharma both of them gave the argument of dharma justifying their actions so then what is the right thing to do you would have noticed in course of my talk that i presented my learnings from mahabharat as questions not answers because that is the nature of the epic everyone who reads the epic will have their own set of questions but i would strongly urge you to read the epic if not to get inspiration at least to get some solace that men and women far greater than you had to face the same kind of choices they made the same kind of mistakes and despite that we continue to celebrate and worship them and finally the reason you should read the mahabharat because ultimately it is a story of flawed beings trying to create meaningful lives in an imperfect world and isn't that what all of us are trying to do thank you